Hello, my name is Lowell Vanderpool and this channel is dedicated to IT students, IT professionals, and anyone who enjoys learning technical subjects. We're going to be taking a look at the new Network technologies, security technologies, programming technology, both container, cloud, all of those industry initiatives that are being developed across the IT ecosystem, how Microsoft is incorporating those into its new platforms, both Windows 11 as well as Server 2022. Operating systems like Windows and Linux and Mac are struggling with incorporating this constant technology ecosystem forward momentum from the storage, Internet Engineering Task Force, IEEE, which is constantly improving layer one technologies such as wireless, wired, fiber, the Linux Foundation, which is this constant explosion of innovation. And of course, now Microsoft is tied to the hip with Linux. So all of that has to be considered in each new version of Windows, as well as software, Redfish, JSON, containers and cloud, and of course, security. So each operating system has its work cut out in incorporating this new constant changing technology, innovation and standards. Let's take a look at how Microsoft approaches these problems in their newest version of Server 2022 and Windows 11. Microsoft is now partnering with their OEM hardware vendors to provide what is known as Secure Core Server. So let's take a look at what that is. Microsoft provides a website that allows enterprise vendors to find hardware that is Microsoft Server certified. And I'm at the Windows Server catalog. And if you come down to Servers over here, on the left hand side, you'll notice there's 657 servers that meet some version of Microsoft certified standard. Let's click it and take a look. Again, on the left, if you'll notice additional features, there's a section called Secure Core Servers. And out of those 600 servers, 83 meet this feature. So I'm gonna check this box. All the servers provided from this Secure Core list are certified for Windows Server 2022. Server 2022 will run on a lots of hardware. If you want to choose hardware that meets the new Secure Core Server specifications, this is where you go. So this is the latest Intel Secure Core Server motherboard. There are certain hardware features that have to be baked into these new servers to meet these new certification standards. Secure Core Server starts with a big problem is reducing the firmware attack surface because firmware is becoming an attractive attack vector due to the fact that firmware runs outside of the scope of the operating system. Some call this ring minus two. Most vendors in the past were using static root trust measurement or SRTM and we're looking at trying to validate the boot chain from initializing hardware with a power on button, the complex code that is running in our typical UEFI bias, then starting the boot chain of files to launch the operating system that we're running. Validating and trusting this is becoming more and more critical. If you've been watching any of the Black Hat or DEF CON presentations, you have a right to be really, really nervous. Is my operating system running on something I can trust? Now you heard me just talk about firmware running in ring negative two. And if you wondered what in the world is he talking about, let's go back in time to 8086, one of the first Intel designs with the x86 platform. They designed this new CPU so that the CPU would protect memory of code running on the processor. They designed it with four rings of privilege or protection. Some people call it protection, some people call it privilege. If you ran your code in ring zero, and that is actually where Windows runs kernel, it is protected by the CPU from all the other code running in the other rings. For example, Microsoft uses only two of the four rings. It uses ring zero for kernel, 
ring three for user mode. It really doesn't use ring one and it doesn't use ring two at all. Neither does Linux. Now, interestingly enough, if you run VirtualBox, it puts the guest kernel in ring one. It's the only application I know that uses a ring other than ring zero or ring three. Now, all of that was true up until they developed type one hypervisors. And Intel came up with a set of instructions that gave the hypervisor more privilege or more protection than even the kernel. Now, some people started coming out and calling this ring negative one. This is where the hypervisor, the memory space that the hypervisor uses is protected even from ring zero, the kernel. So now we have ring negative one, the hypervisor code for a type one hypervisor, ring zero for a kernel, ring three for user mode. But as we look at our server and PC platforms, there is more. And a lot of security analysis are now bringing up the concept of ring negative two, and that's called system management mode. And that's where your UEFI is actually running code. This is known as real mode. When you hit the power button and you launch your Intel processor, I don't care if it's an i9 or it's the latest Intel Xeon processor, you start in real mode. This is a special mode of the processor and this is where your UEFI is running. And this is also known as system management mode. It is also totally protected against all other things. It has a level of privilege that all the other rings of protection don't have. This is also now a vector of attack. On top of that, we know if you run enterprise hardware, you know that Intel has its Intel management engine. We've all loaded those Intel management engine drivers on our enterprise desktops and enterprise servers. That is now a special chip with microcode in the chipset that allows remote management of a platform and provisioning outside, totally outside, of all these other codes that are running on your system. There actually was a vulnerability in 2017 that allowed attackers to go into the Intel management platform. This is known as ring negative three. Now, if that wasn't enough, we have attacks on the actual microcode running in Intel and AMD processors. And this is that microcode section. We haven't given it a negative ring designation, but just be aware that microcode is being hacked. And then we have the silicone itself. So this now gives us a picture of all the various levels of privilege and protection, the rings, so to speak, of now attack vectors that are going against our operating systems and hardware platforms. Microsoft security posturing as of Windows 11 and Server 2022 is fundamentally shown in this graphic. It's called security from chip cloud, from the motherboard, the silicon, the firmware, the TPM, all of the hardware components on the motherboard all the way to you get to logging onto your cloud provider is supposed to be secure with a variety of security components that they provide. This is the goal from chip to cloud. And we all know that is really challenging. Now, SRTM, which is Static Root Trust of Measurement, was used in the early methods for protecting the boot process. It establishes trust at system boot up or reset, requires that trust is maintained throughout the entire boot process. If it's discovered that there's something wrong in the boot process, something doesn't, hash value doesn't match what it should be, then the boot process is stopped and it's unrecoverable until you reset the system. For example, if you have secure boot turned on and you just slip in your USB boot drive in and try to boot to that USB hard drive or that USB flash drive, it's just going to fail. It's going to say, no, it's not meeting all these requirements and we're just going to bail out. So you literally had to go in and turn off secure boot and then you could go back and access the boot process firmware and make changes. One of the problems of SR SRTM is that as there were many models of PCs from many, many vendors and different UEFI versions, as well as different configurations for laptops, different configurations for all-in-one, all the various configurations that OEM manufacturers were faced with in developing a firmware for that product, you started getting this incredibly large number of SRTM measurements upon boot up. This is moving or moving away from SRTM into what's called dynamic root 
root trust measurement, DRTM. Now, if you look at the graphic on the left, you can see there's an area that's yellow and it says firmware outside trust boundary. And you could see a number of areas where it says firmware outside trust boundary. In other words, we're allowing the OEM to configure their firmware so that it makes sense for a laptop, a tablet, a server, or whatever you're designing. And we're not worried about what changes and modifications that the OEM is doing on their firmware. Bottom line though, is when they get to a certain point, we're going to create a no execute environment on that firmware. We're gonna lock down memory so it's all read only. And then at that point, we're gonna validate, is your firmware certifiable at this point. And at that point, we accept what is happening at the BIOS or firmware level. Now, the way that Microsoft deals with this DRTM is it uses def Windows Defender System Guard Secure Launch. So Windows 10, Windows 11, servers all boot and they do a series of integrity measurements that are taken as you do the boot and they compare them with hash values and certificates in the TPM 2.0. Now, this takes care of the boot process. We can be assured that we're getting validated code up until we start booting the Windows process. But what about when we're running Windows after two hours or six days in a server farm? How do we know that there has not been a compromise of the firmware code? And that is where Windows Defender System Guard comes in. Not only does it help you protect the boot process, but it also protects the firmware code during runtime of the, of the server, the PC, etc. Now, if you're scratching your head and saying, Mr. Vanderpool, I don't see Windows Defender System Guard in my system, and I don't, I don't see DRTM even mentioned in my firmware, in Windows, etc. What, what are we talking about? As Windows was developing its versions, at some point, and I believe it was 1807, Microsoft shifted all of this technology, the Windows Defender System Guard, DRTM, all into what is now known as Secure Boot. So if you have the later versions of Windows 10 or Windows 11, and you have the hardware support for Secure Boot, and you enable it, all of the things that I've talked about, protecting the firmware, no execute at some point, the firmware can no longer execute code, read only memory space for the firmware, measurements of everything as the boot process goes, all that now is in the later versions of Windows 10 and Windows 11 under one heading, Secure Boot. Now I'm going to go through this slide deck pretty quickly because I want to get to the demonstrations and I want to show you how to do this stuff. So I'm going to go through these pretty quick. You can download these PowerPoints and the video notes in a video description. So what are the requirements for Secure Core? One, Secure Core requires a secure supply chain. So we need to make sure that chips and components from the OEM are the proper chips and components. Hard, uh, TPM 2.0 provides us our hardware root of trust, secure boot with DRT system guard with kernel direct memory access. This provides protection for those external devices that plug in your PCI bus. Thunderbolt 3. So there's, that's a very important issue. Virtualized based security, VBS, and hypervisor based code integrity, which makes sure the drivers in your kernel are signed. Your system must be an x64. You must have SLAT, second level address translation, of course, virtualization, TPM 2.0, SMM protection, supported firmware, UEFI memory reporting, MOR2 memory overwrite request, and HVCI or hypervisor code integrity. So those are required in order to get a lot of the secure core components up and running. You can look at whether you're compliant with secure core servers and PCs using the Windows Admin Center. I'm going to demonstrate that coming up very quickly. So Windows Admin Center will allow you to see the status of your secure core feature, and you can also enable and disable features, although I found that still a little bit iffy. Microsoft in this chip to cloud security paradigm that it produces for Server 2022 and Windows 11, there's many security features that are available to the IT professional. The problem is they're, they're confusing. They have different methods of enabling them. They apply to different versions of Windows. They require different hardware requirements. It's not a cohesive, simple process, which is a pain. 
Microsoft lacks a simple method of enabling all these security components. Windows Hello, FIDO2, BitLocker, Windows Defender Application Guard, which provides a very good virtualized browser, TPM, Secure Boot, Kernel DMA Protection, Device Health Assertion, and SMB Encryption. All of them are there. None of them are easy. The key to so many of these security components is VBS. We're going to take a hypervisor, take a chunk of memory, put it under the control of the hypervisor, and over there we're going to validate drivers. Over there we're going to hide credentials. Over there we're going to have this secure chunk of memory that the regular operating system is totally separated from this virtualized chunk of memory. If you're in Windows 10 and Windows 11 and you want to turn on VBS and HVCI, you have to be able to go to your Windows Security, go to device security, go to core isolation, and if you can turn on memory integrity, you're basically turning on VBS and HVCI. But if you're an IT professional, we're going to use a tool called the Device Guard Credential Guard Hardware Readiness Tool. I'm going to demonstrate every step of this. With the readiness tool, we're going to be able to check your system to see does it support these features, to enable these features, and even disable them. This is a quick peek at what we're going to see in my demonstration. It does an elegant job of enabling these features. I love this tool. The tool also creates a great log file so you can go back and look at it and see what took place. And of course, you can always use msinfo32.exe to also look to see the status of your virtualization components and security components. There is a GPO that you can use to enable a lot of these components. I'll have that in the video notes. Now, if you're in an organization where you have a limited amount of money and generally the IT pro is responsible for everything. If you work for a nonprofit or an education institution, you have a lot more responsibility to do just about everything there is to do. Large organizations can bring third party in to do a lot of this type of work. But if you're one of those organizations like I was involved in for years, the IT pros did everything. Let me show you a tool that's really good. You can go to Windows Download and look up Device Guard Credential Guard Hardware Readiness Tool. It's just a compressed file that ends up with extracting into a, a series of files and includes a PowerShell script. Now I've downloaded that on my workstation. I've moved it across to the network to my Windows 2022 server and I've thrown it in my downloads folder. And I open it up and I, there's a series of files in there. One of them is my PowerShell script right here. DG Readiness Tool version 3.6. Now the goal of this tool is to get Device Guard installed and Credential Guard installed. The reason I'm using this tool to install a lot of the components for Secure Core is that it does this automatic and you get Device Guard and Credential Guard to boot. Now keep in mind, Credential Guard cannot be run on an Active Directory domain controller. So don't run Credential Guard on your Active Directory domain controller, but everything else can be run. I pull down the settings for this virtual machine where I'm running my server in, and you can see I've got Secure Boot and TPM enabled. My first step is to go ahead and run PowerShell. I'm going to run it as an administrator. And I'm need, I need to move, because I've just brought these files on the server, the environmental variables to the path for where these files are at are not appropriate. So I need to move my prompt over to where the files are. So I'm going to start by changing directory. I'm going to go back to explore and just grab this path, this directory path, because that's where my files are. And I'm going to paste them in and hit enter and notice my prompt is now where the files are actually at. So I'm going to start with my dot forward slash, which is the path to the PowerShell script, which is PS1 right here. Double click. Now, I went ahead and created a text file with the arguments and switches. So I'm going to take use of those and just copy and paste. So you can see a text file here in front of you, and it shows you the various arguments that you can use with this PowerShell script. Mine is capable. Are you capable of running Device Guard, Credential Guard, HVCI, which if you can run HVCI, you can run VBS. And it does have an auto reboot. You can decide to use that or not. And then once I know the status of my server, then I can come back and do the enable. So minus enable, 
and then I can turn on Device Guard, Credential Guard. It will automatically enable HVCI and VBS if they're not already on. And if you want to use the Auto Reboot, which is probably not a good idea for a server, but fine for a PC, you can also do that. And you also have the Disable function. So if they're on and you want to turn them off, you can come down here and use Disable and turn those or enable or disable those components. So let's first look at validating whether I can do this. So I'm gonna copy that and put that in my PowerShell and then hit enter. It says, do you wanna run this unpublished? And we'll run it once. And you can see it's running all the tests. And then you can see it's going to reboot. And it's done all the tests on this PC to allow me to see whether this is going to work or not. Close and wait for it to reboot me. Now you could have just left off the auto reboot switch on that PowerShell and it wouldn't have rebooted. You could have read the screen, but you can go to your C drive and notice you've got a folder called DG logs. And this allows you to open up a log file and you can see what took place as it looked at your server and hardware to see does it support these components and it tells you a lot of great information and it says that HVCI was already enabled on the machine driver compatibility may not be complete it says please disable HVCI and run the script again we're going to re-execute this script after reboot and we'll try it again now I went back and did exactly like I just showed you again so I'm going to run the tool again. This time I'm going to remove the auto reboot feature and just let it sit there so we can take a look at the screen. So we're going to run it again. Yep, run once so that we can see what is going on. Here we can see that no incompatible drivers were found. Secure boot is present. We see that HSTI is absent. I'm not sure what that is. It's a 64-bit architecture. The PC edition, the server edition is supported. Virtualization firmware check is passed. TPM 2.0 is there. Secure MOR is absent. The NX protector is available. The SMM mitigation is absent. And it says that device guard and credential guard can be enabled on this machine. And then it gives me a list of certain features and functions that are not on this particular PC. That's what I want to know. I up arrowed on my prompt and pulled up my first PowerShell script line. And I'm going to remove all of this and I'm going to replace it with my text file that's going to allow me to enable. So I'm going to grab that, copy it, and paste it by my PowerShell. This time I'm going to enable these features. Get to the auto reboot and hit enter, run once, and watch it go. And we can actually watch it turn on these features, set up the registry keys, enable the policies and it's going to and we can see it's enabled Hyper-V, I-O-M-M-U, the PC is going to reboot. It's done everything for me. It's just really sweet. So now all my components that I want for secure core plus to boot I get device guard and credential guard. Remember credential guard not on your Active Directory server but on everything else you get all the components just by running the readiness tool. Now, another method you can use to look at the status of your server is MS Info 32. Coming from the system summary, we can just kind of walk down. We see we have UEFI, we have secure boot is on. We can slide down. VBS is running. And let me scroll this over and this over so we can see. Here we can see VBS security properties are available. We see that VBS security services are configured. VBS services are running. Here we see Credential Guard running and Hyper-V Info's Code Integrity or HVCI is running. VBS is running. Great way to also look at the status of these security components using MS Info 32. Now, Windows Admin Center does allow you to look at the situation of Secure Core. 
does allow you to look at secure core status. It does have an enable disable. It isn't working right now. It is in preview mode. I will give Microsoft credit that it's in preview mode. So let's go take a look at it and see what it says and what it does or does not do. Now this is in development mode. So by the time you look at it and you use it in Windows Admin Center, it may be working. So I'm going to launch this domain computer. Give it just a minute. It's pulling up the overview of this domain PC. And I'm going to slide down till we get to security. We're going to click on security. It has a preview. Again, it's indicating that some of this is new. And there is now a secure core tab under security. So I'm going to click on that. And of course, it's running some PowerShell to pull up this information. So this is my status. Now, when I ran this the first time, it wasn't accurate. And I went ahead and checked this box like here. And I refreshed over here, this little refresh button, and it did come back with a more accurate status of my secure core. The enable disable, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but it doesn't do anything. It doesn't enable or it doesn't disable. So that may be coming. Uh, again, it's in preview mode. This is a feature that's under development. The fact that you can check all these boxes and then come over and do a refresh, it did give me a more accurate view as to where I stand in Secure Core. Could, could I do some configuration to make this happen? Was it totally not supported, et cetera, et cetera. So it's nice in that respect. Not very helpful outside of just giving you more accurate understanding of the present PC you're working on. Just as a note, I had just finished working with one of my motherboards, the AS Rock motherboard. It's a B365. And I had used the readiness tool, put the TPM in, secure boot, VBS, HVCI was enabled. After I came back with the Windows Admin Center, I could see there was the system guard was still not configured and was not enabled, but it looked like it supported it. So I went in the Windows Admin Center, uh, checked the box, hit the enable, and to my shock, it said, okay, I'll turn it on. And all you have to do is reboot. So it does work for some things. If you hold your head right and you're, the stars are aligned, that's the first time that I've seen the enable work on any PC that I've done this.